What is a remarkable common link between the overwhelming majority of mass shootings in America? We have a way of preventing school shootings. Why is it a mistake for society to focus so much on issues women face, while not prioritizing challenges men might encounter? It went from being, I am woman, I am strong, to I am woman, I've been wronged. To understand more about what's going on in our society today, I sit down with Dr. Warren Farrell, author of The Boy Crisis and The Myth of Male Power. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kellick. Warren Farrell, such a pleasure to have you on American Thought Leaders. It is really a pleasure to have you in my home. Well, it's great to be here, Warren. You know, you've been doing a bit of work looking at um, some of these folks that have perpetrated mass shootings in the past, and you've you know drawn some conclusions about their histories and so forth. And of course, this is something that that we've been seeing a number of times now in uh, 2021. Tell me, tell me what you're seeing. Well, I see a number of things happening. One is uh, there's, there's common denominators among mass shooters. The most obvious is that they're male. Uh, Ninety-eight percent are male. Um, a second common denominator is that they're almost all dad-deprived males. So you have two groups of mass shooters um, that enormously overlap. One is the school shooters, and the other are mass shooters that are shooting areas that are not schools. Um, but the, the school shooters in particular tend to be um, boys who are uh, suicidal, depressed, and also dad-deprived. Uh, that is, like the recent, a recent school shooter in Indianapolis um, was his father committed suicide when he was just barely a teenager. And that's a, a, that type of pattern, the father missing, getting a divorce, um, not being involved in the child's life at all, uh, the, um, and, the, and the child feeling that he, he doesn't have a constructive role model to channel his testosterone, uh, feels that he's been abandoned. Uh, Stephen Paddock, the biggest um, school, uh, mass shooter in, in U.S. history, uh, who killed 59 people and uh, four or 500 uh, were injured in the shooting in Las Vegas. Some people will remember um, his father um, had been in a prison and then the father escaped prison. And then, the, um, and then he was captured and put into a maximum security prison. And Stephen kept hoping that he would come home, come home, come home, and be with him again. Um, and, he, uh, and the father then instead tried to impress himself or whoever um, by, by escaping uh, the maximum security prison again just three or four weeks before he would otherwise have been free to come home and be with Stephen. Stephen was, so, according to his mother, was so devastated by the fact that his father made a, cho a choice to demonstrate his genius of being able to um, escape from a maximum security prison instead of coming home to him and being with him. He wanted to prove himself uh, worthy of his father to also be a genius. So he, he, he um, constructed, he put together the most complex and, and um, heinously successful mass shooting in all of U.S. history. Um, and it's, a, it's just a way of saying, you know, Dad, I'm like you are. Pay attention to me. You can't ignore me. Um, and why didn't you come home to me? Why weren't you with me? Um, but these stories of, you know, uh, whether it's Adam Lanza or uh, the Parkland shooting, and it was, it's one boy who is fatherless after another boy. The dad deprivation combined uh, with being male uh, oftentimes leads to uh, depression and, um, and uh, suicidal tendencies. Mass shootings, what we think of when we think of mass shootings, is the people who are hurt. We don't realize that all of these people who are hurt are hurt by boys who are hurt, who are deprived of their dads, who are feeling neglected and depressed. When boys become mass shooters, um, we are not saying, or I am not saying, that they should not be fully punished and fully held accountable for this. It's a heinous crime that has to be held fully accountable. And I'm also saying we care about protecting ourselves both from mass shootings and also from the other things that, the crimes that the boys who are both dad deprived and depressed and suicidal um, tend to do. And, and if we're gonna prevent those things from happening, we can catch the boy in the process of his grief. 
and at the same time save ourselves. So we're, we're, we have a win-win situation. Care about boys and boys will act more constructively. Their testosterone will be channeled more constructively. Um, do not care about their feelings and their fears. And, um, and what's happening with them. And not only will that boy pay the price, but often he'll act out in a criminal way. He'll join a gang, he'll be a drug dealer, um, he'll commit a crime, rob a bank, do something along those lines. Um, he'll just drop out of high school. He'll be a, ta a tax drainer rather than a taxpayer. Um, he, he will not be able to be a good father to, uh, uh, to a, a female uh, that is looking for a good father. Um, he, uh, he will create many, many prices for the society at the same time as, as, as it will be a price on him. And so one of the things I did when I did the research for this, for the boy crisis, is I found what are the things that are signs of boys being hurt um, and, and developed some 63, uh, a whole inventory that I believe we should be giving to every boy and, and girl in school and ask, asking them, do you have these experiences? Because if you have these experiences, these are red flags that the guidance counselors and the psychologists in school uh, should be paying attention to. So for example, um, if one of the questions that is on the inventory is, um, do you feel that no one loves you and no one needs you and there's no hope of that changing? That's a huge red flag. Another question is, do you feel that if you shared your, your real feelings with somebody um, who liked you, that they would lose respect for you? Hmm. Are you Caucasian or Native American? Because if you're Caucasian or Native American, you're more likely to commit suicide than you are if you're Hispanic or African American or Asian in the United States. Most of the mass shooters are not only males, um, but the, a good percentage of them, a disproportionate percentage of them, are also Caucasian males. And what is there about Caucasian males? So we have to be asking these questions. And one of the things that there are about Caucasian males is these Caucasian males are often middle or upper middle class. What's happening in middle and upper middle class families that is not happening as much um, in black families or African-American families. It's there's expectations that the, that the boys have on them that often their sister or their brother has done well in a good school and he has dropped out of high school. And so he's beginning to feel, feel ashamed of himself. And so he starts tur turning inward on himself and becoming depressed and then starts getting involved with alcohol or addiction to you know, drugs or opioids um, and then be or begins to be addicted to video games and then he becomes seen as a loser. And girls, as a rule, don't want to date losers. Um, and so he starts turning to pornography because pornography is access to a variety of attractive women without fear of rejection at a price he can afford. So he starts becoming addicted to one thing or the other. The more addicted he becomes, uh, the more depressed um, he, be he, he becomes. And these are some, just a few of the multiple characteristics. The big news that I'm saying there is we have a way of preventing school shootings. We have a way of preventing mass shootings. And two of those ways are discovering the boys around us who are hurt. Because all the boys who hurt us are boys who hurt. So you developed this concept, which, you know, again, I just learned about recently, which I thought was really fascinating, the, the lace curtain. Mm -hmm. Tell me about this. The, the lace curtain is what I've experienced since I began to speak about something other than men being the enemy and um, men having all the power. Um, and the lace curtain is that um, I, I used to write almost with every with 100 percent acceptance for the new york times now i can, can't get anything in the new york times um, i used to um, be on all the t today shows that you know what used to be called the tomorrow show the oprah winfrey show and so on and the first time i talked to oprah winfrey's producer about you know I, i'd like to present something more than just the feminist perspective a more complex perspective that was the last out of five times that they they called me um, and the first time I be brought these issues up on the Phil Donahue show, which some of the older people listening will remember, uh, who was basically the Oprah Winfrey before Oprah Winfrey, um, this I was dropped by the producers who had had me on eight times when I started speaking about men also have feelings and fears and things that need to be considered. 
um, he intuitively sensed that that would not be popular with his mostly female audience and just um, dropped me for um, many, many years. And so um, this, th this is just, you know, what I've just mentioned is just the very tip of the iceberg. And so the lace curtain is basically not being able to talk about these issues that incorporate the male experience of powerlessness and the male experience of female power but only being able to speak about the female experience of powerlessness and the female experience of male power. That is what the, quote, progressive mainstream liberal media is open to, and it's closed to any discussion of, um, of, of uh, male powerlessness. Well, and this is quite incredible because you started documenting, you know, this sort of... Uh I guess, approach, um, whether it's in the media or in, uh, you know, women's studies, uh, uh, the women's, women's studies discipline, as early as I think 1975, I was reading. Mm -hmm. It's remarkable to me. I mean, we're, we're, we're in 2021 today. This has been something that's been ongoing for quite some time. Yes. Yeah, so I, I remember teaching in the, um, I was teaching in the first women's studies department in the United States in San Diego State University. And I was talking about and just you know, exclusively women's issues, but I was beginning to develop some understanding and empathy for, for men as well. And I, as I brought those issues into the chorus, um, it was mostly approved of, um, but uh, by m the great majority of students loved it and appreciated it and felt that they grew by it. But there was tension. And I was told to be careful of what I said and not to maybe include that. And maybe you can leave this portion out. And then I taught at the School of Medicine at the University of California in San Diego. And um, for a few years, I guess, just got extremely rave reviews from my class. But one time I was suddenly, I had, when I was bringing up some of these issues, one feminist student female complained. And that was the end of me. Um, and so that, uh, as, a, as a teacher at UCSD. University of California, San Diego.